lecture ever, right? Because most of you will only have lab and that doesn't really have lectures, so congratulations if that's the right word. Um, all right, so you guys have your projects due Monday four, by 4 o'clock. I'll put a box outside of my door. Put them in the box by 4 o'clock because at 4 o'clock I'm just going to grab the box, put it in my office and go home. <laughs> so if, if you're late, you won't even have anywhere to put it. You know, never know what person might steal it from outside my office if you just keep it there. All right, then we have a uh, final exam. Let's see, do we agree it's Thursday at 8 o'clock in the morning or something like that? That's right. 8 a.m. In, in Moral. You, you should go like a half hour early to try to find the room if you've ever been over there. It's like north, south, east, west, central. You never know. All right. Um, and so let me tell you something about the exam before we go over this exam. First of all, exam's cumulative. Okay? Second of all, exam's open book. By open book, I mean you can bring um, your book, obviously, the lecture notes, your homeworks, your exams, and stuff like that. Not a printout of all the exams. Not that it's going to, not that I'm going to give you an old problem or anything, but not, not like a printout of all the exams ever created by Mike Henson that you probably have access to, I've learned, okay? Um, all right. Um, and then when you get the exam, so I'm going to go over this exam. This exam is longer than your exam is going to be. Remember, I promised you to shorten up the exam, but I didn't promise them. Okay. And um, so it's, this one's kind of long. Yours will be shorter. But obviously, the first thing you want to do when you get the exam is just read through the whole exam. Take five minutes. See what, you, see what you're up against, right? You can do the exam in any order you want because I'll give you the answers for the part you need to do the subsequent part. So it's really up to you how you want to do it. Um, but at least for from my perspective, to do the parts of the exam you know and have confidence in and get those out of the way will minimize the sense of panic that you might get, right? If you, if you, if you tackle the first problem and 15 minutes later you've made no progress and panic starts and that's never desirable. Um, in terms of studying, the best way to study um, is, well, the homeworks are, you know, you only have some finite amount to study, right? If I were you, first thing I would do is study this exam and then I would study the midterm exams um, one and two, right? You have both ones from this semester that you did and the ones from the previous semester. There's five exams posted with solutions. That's where I'd start. If you have more time than that, then you can go, go do the homeworks. I would do everything backwards, if you know what I mean. Like I wouldn't focus completely on the first exam because the exams are going to obviously have some emphasis on the newer material. So I would like start with the final exam that I'm going over now and then work your way backwards. All right? And um, if you're comfortable with the, that material, you should be okay. Um, you should not just read the exam and the solution, because if you read the exam and the solution, it'll look, it'll look easy, for sure, <laughs> right? Because I've given you. So you should actually work the problem. And then if you get stuck, maybe go to another part, and you know, eventually you go back and figure out what you got stuck. But if you simply sit down one night and read the exams and the solutions, I, I don't think that'll be good enough, okay? The other thing I'm always r surprised at is, and I don't know why I have to tell people this, but you should sleep the night before the exam, okay? Sometimes I get people, and I really did terrible the exam, and I ask them this question, when do you go to sleep? They're like, four in the morning. I'm like, what time did you get up? They're like, six. There you go, okay? So, I mean, let's put it this way. If, if, it, um, if at midnight, the night before the exam, you don't know the material, you aren't going to be learning it, okay, by that time. So, so just make sure you're not totally exhausted and panicked and freaked out when you, when you walk in. All right. So I think that's basically it. All right, so let's go over this exam. I'm not going to be able to go over every step because we don't really have like 45 minutes probably at this point. Um, so I'll go over as much as I can and I'll outline everything. Okay, now one caveat here. This exam had more of an emphasis on the plant-wide control stuff because I did two more lectures last year. I was able to get to two more lectures last year than this year, okay? So I don't want you to interpret this final exam to mean, oh my God, he's going to focus completely on the last lecture that he gave, right? So I'm just telling you, it was structured this way because I got through more material last year and therefore it had a greater emphasis on this, okay? But still. So I might, I might go in actually a different order than, um, than is listed here because I want to emphasize maybe the parts down further because I think they're more likely <laughs> to be on your exam, okay? But anyway, I'm giving you a, a plant here, and as usual, it's very wordy, right? And so I'll, I'm just going to I'm going to show you the picture. But obviously, what the words here are meant to do is tell you what the picture looks like, okay? And so your goal, one of the first goals here, is to take this picture 
and put it into a, a diagram, okay? So rather than read all this laborious material, which does nothing more than tell you how to draw this, I'm just gonna show you what it ends up looking like, okay? Um, and last time we attempted this, you couldn't see the solution. Oh, there, there's the actual problem statement. So hopefully this time we'll have a little more luck and it'll be visible. As usual, I had a couple of typos. Um, so, I, so FD is some, uh, so this thing consists of a reactor, a flash drum, and a distillation column. And I accidentally put flash drum here instead of, and there's also a reflux drum. So somebody caught me and I fixed, actually I think I fixed that. Then, and then I just had a typo in instead of is. That's not bad by my standards. All right. So let's see if we can actually see. That's the best I've ever seen, right, <laughs> for, for this projector system at least. Okay, so this was what the picture was meant to look like. Okay, so what do we have? We have these reactions taking place. A plus B goes to C, A plus B goes to D. The feed consists of A and B going into a reactor. The reactor is exothermic, therefore it's cooled. Okay, the effluent is cooled down or heated up, depending on w the situation, um, and put into a flash drum, FD, okay? You flash off the light materials, which is, are the reactants, and you recycle those back to the reactor. Um, in order to recycle those, is you, you, right, you want to recycle a liquid, so the vapor off here you condense, you store it in a drum to hold the inventory, and that goes back as, as recycle. The, the, the heavier material from the flash drum goes to a column, and then you separate it, okay? There's nothing that, yeah? Uh, like the, the heating and Here? Um, yep. Yeah, on the, on the pipe. Um, so, like, on the exam, would we uh, have to just denote that it's a condenser uh, by, uh, like, drawing the, the arrow pointing the opposite direction? Oh, I don't care about that. <laughs> all right, like I'm drawing these all the same. They're all exchangers, right? Sometimes you're cooling and sometimes you're heating, but I, I know you're cooling here because you're taking a vapor and making a liquid, so. Yeah, it'll be all right. Any, just this little thing will look fine, right? Okay. Or just put a little box that says HE heat exchanger. It's anything's fine, just let me know you're heating or cooling the stream. Again, I don't want you to freak out, right? Because this, this looks like, oh my God, right? Last time, I had a lot more time to cover this. All right, so, so now what I ask people to do, and I'm gonna skip this part and maybe come back to it, because I wanna cover the material I know is gonna be on the exam uh, instead of the stuff that's not as likely to be emphasized for your own good. Um, but if we look at the problem statement, and this, this solution is, well I shouldn't say ask if it's posted, that's where I got it from myself, so I know it's posted. Okay, and the first part I ask you these things. Okay, and these are things that right now I think you could probably do, but it's not gonna be emphasized to this level. If you look at this, what this is, 30 of the 100 points on the exam, okay? Because again, I did three times the amount of lecture. So if I wanted to do something like this on your exam, it'd more like be 10 points out of 100, but I haven't done it yet, so I don't know. But I'm just, I don't want you to worry so much that this seems more advanced than you're used to, or you're not comfortable with this, because we didn't cover it at the same level. But anyway, I asked you, what are the 12 things you wanna control? If we have time, we'll come back to that. You can look at the list. They start with things like inventories, then product quality things. Okay, we'll come back to it. Um, and then I ask you, what things can you manipulate in order to control it? And then I ask you to draw a picture of the control scheme. Okay, that's all fine. I'll show you that if we have time or you can look. But um, I want to show you this because all the other parts build on that picture. And then I say things like, and I'm gonna give you a little hint here. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure this. I said, assume that, um, you, I'm giving you a model that reflects the f effect of the reactor coolant rate on the reactor temperature. And up there I asked you, what should you use to control what? Well, it's a good chance that one, a good answer was use coolant flow on the reactor to control <laughs> reactor temperature. But anyway, it's kind of, kind of up to you to decide. Um, and so what, what I do at this point is I just go through a series of different variables that are paired together and ask you to do different things like check if, the, you know, the range of controller gains is stable. Dry, design an IMC controller, design a cascade controller, do feed forward control, just for all these different pairs, okay? So even if you couldn't do this at all, which again will not be emphasized so much, you could just immediately do the other stuff, all right? But just for um, completeness, I'll come back to this in a minute. The, 
This is one of my greatest achievements, and even though I'm telling you it's not emphasized, I just want to show it to you because I'm so impressed that I was able to draw this. Because you know I can't draw worth squat. Okay. So this was the this was the control scheme I came up with. Okay. I was hoping that people would come up with this because again we had a greater emphasis on this. Um, and so I don't know if I want to go through all this. Well, I mean it's kind of obvious. You want to control the flow A and B going into the reactor. You 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 have an exothermic reactor, you need to cool it, you probably want to use the coolant temperature to control the temperature. You want to control the inventory in the reactor by controlling the outlet um, flow out of the reactor. Um, you want to have a controlled temperature for the flash, so you need to have a control the utility to the exchanger to get the temperature for the flash here. You need to control the level in the flash drum um, in order to send the, the um, Sorry, by manipulating the flow to the column, you'd like to control the overhead pressure, which we talked about in a flash drum, to get the separation you want. You want to control the inventory in this recycled dr drum with the flow out of the drum. Um, and then the typical things in the column here. Okay. Which is like you'd like to control um, level in the, over, in the overhead drum, right, the reflex drum, by manipulating, in this case, the flow out. You could also use the reflex, but uh, you want to control the level on the bottom of the column by adjusting the bottom's flow, and then you want to do composition control, in this case using reflex flow, and in this case using duty to the reboiler. Okay, so fine. It all makes sense. Could you do this? You could do, mo I, could, you could do I think, most of this, or part, at least part of this, but I'm not liable to ask this level of detail. I'm just telling you this, okay? So with that in mind, now I'm going to do something like the following. I'm going to say, um, I want you now to design this controller, okay? D you didn't have to in part one know you're going to do it because I'm telling you now do it. So if you didn't figure out it in part one, obviously if you read part two first, that's why you want to read the whole exam, that probably should be part of your answer for part one. But All right, so I'm, I'm going to give you a model for how the um, um, f f coolant flow affects the reactor temperature and then I'm going to ask you to do some controller design. So I'm just going to take some of these control loops. I think there's 12 of them. So not all of them, but like four of them and ask you to do different things in part in problem two, problem three, problem four, and problem five, okay? And the reason I'm going to that first is because that's more likely to be of um, the kind of things I'm going to ask you on the exam. Okay, so let's start with that. So problem two here, and obviously also when you look at the points, the points are allocated according to how d much work or difficult it is. So if something's worth a small number of points, I think it's easy to do and it takes no thinking. If it's worth a lot of points, it's either a fair amount of work or it actually takes some thinking. Okay, so that's how I allo allocate the points. So um, if you see something that's five <coughs> points, your immediate conclusion is I should be able to do that in two or three minutes. That's what I would say. Okay. Um, anyway, so now I'm saying I'm going to give you the effect of the reactant coolant flow rate, which I call the input in this case, on the reactor temperature, which I'll call the output. And I assume it's this um, transfer function here. Sorry, it's not a transfer function. That's a, sta that's a set of linear differential equations. Okay? Then the first thing I ask you to do is take this um, set of differential equations and convert it into a transfer function. Now this normally would be trivial, um, but usually when I give you an output, I tell you it's just one of the state variables, right? Usually this, this thing here will be like 1, 0, or 0, 1, depending on which one of the x's is the output. But in this case, I'm telling you it's a linear combination of the two x's. Do you follow me? So um, if you want to solve this, which I know you do, let's see how I actually solved it. And because there's two ways to solve this, only one of which I taught you this semester. So let's see if I... Okay, good. I solved it in scalar form. You can also find transfer functions using matrix calculations, but I did not show you guys how to do that. Okay, so let's see what the solution looks like. Okay, I'm just regurgitating the equations right here. I don't know if you can see them very well. But I think rather than go through every step, I'll just outline the procedure and then you have time to go back and look at the details. That way I'll be able to get through it all. Okay, so first thing I'm going to do is write out the differential equations in scalar form. There's the differential equation for x1 and there's the differential equation for x2. It's, it's not hard to do. You just pull it directly out of this, right? The first row. I mean, everyone knows how to write this thing in scalar form. If you don't know that, what can I say? 
I can't help you now, okay? All right, so I wrote out the two equations in scalar form. So um, hopefully you can read these. These are both one halves, minus one half plus one half, x1, x2 plus u. And the second equation is just dx2 dt equal x1, okay? <laughs> All right, so obviously, you know, when you have two equations like that, obviously you're going to find a transfer function. What are you going to do? First thing you do is make sure the equations are linear. They're linear. That's why I put them in. They're already in matrix form, so they have to be linear. Um, and then you take the Laplace transform of the equations, right? Then you're going to manipulate them. So when you do this, you typically want to start with the simplest equation, substitute it into the most complex <laughs> equation, right? Just simpler. You get the same answer regardless, but I'll start with this equation because it looks simpler than that equation. So take Laplace transform, right, of this equation. The initial condition, I'm assuming everything's a deviation variable, so the initial condition drops out. So I just get this and I can solve. If This is not easy to read. That's x2. It looks a lot like a 1, but it's not. x2 equals x1 divided by s. Okay? So now I can eliminate x2 wherever it appears in terms of x1. Very easy. Take the Laplace transform of this equation. You get this. Again, um, initial condition drops out. If I don't tell you the initial condition always drops out, you know. <coughs> All right. So, I mean, the implicit, if I give you a set of equations and don't tell you otherwise, you assume they're deviation variables, the initial condition will drop out. All right, so there's the Laplace transform of this differential equation right here, okay? And then all I've done here is eliminate x1 by plugging in right there, okay? All right, so that's great. Um, and now I've gathered the terms involving x1 on the left-hand side. There's that term and that term and that one, and I put them all on the left-hand side like this. Okay? And then I solve for x1 in terms of u from this equation. Okay? But um, now you have to consider that output that I gave you. Okay? And I told you that y was equal to x1 plus 1 half x2. <laughs> so I've already taken the Laplace transform of this equation, but I don't feel like writing S. If you take a Laplace transform of, a diff of an algebraic equation, it's the same as the Laplace transform of the original equation. It's just everything's S. I didn't write S here. Okay? So there's the Laplace transform of that output equation. Um, now, I want to get an equation that involves only x1. So I substitute for x2 from right there. That's x2 equal x1 over S. Plug that in here. Um, <coughs> Simplify, you get this is how y depends on x1, and there's how x1 depends on u. So plug it in, plug that expression in for that right there, and then you get the transfer function that I'm looking for. Okay? All right. So I think that, I don't remember, but I think that was worth 10 points. Why? Because it's a little bit of work. Okay? And again, this exam will probably, your exam, I would say, will be three quarters the length of this one. So it'll be, it'll be shorter, because that's what I promised, right? All right. So you got the transfer function. If you didn't get the transfer function, I wouldn't say it doesn't matter, but you can at least continue with the next part, right? Because I give it to you right there. And again, as usual, if I give you the answer, you have to derive it, right? Sometimes people will do a bunch of stuff and then all of a sudden this appears just out of nowhere. It's just like, wow, that's amazing. <laughs> all right? So, you know, we don't give points for that because we can tell whether you derived it or not. Um, so, but in any case, even, even, you know, even if you can't get all the way here, it, you know, go as far as you can to get, to get the um, answer. All right, so next thing I say is, t is take this transfer function, design a controller, use the direct synthesis method. I want the desired closed loop transfer function to look like this. Do I give you, it doesn't look like I give you a tau c value. Okay, right, so a typical first order desired closed loop response. Determine if this controller is a PID controller. Determine if it has integral action and then See, this is one of the tricky things. It says, use the Roost test to determine if the system is stable. Okay? And then you look at the thing, it's worth five points. <laughs> right? So you're like, wait a minute, he wants me to do this, 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 and this. And it's only worth five points. So you know what your conclusion is? Every step is close to trivial. This one would appear to be complex, right? Typically, this is a fair amount of work. What I'm telling you is, for this problem, it must not be, or it wouldn't be worth five points. So if you end up doing a lot of work on this, you're going the wrong direction. Right? All right. So let's see. You see what I mean? There's the, there's the answer to the whole problem right there, all four parts. Right? 
And the other thing I, I guess I, should, I don't need to tell you, right, if something's worth five points, don't spend a lot of time on it. <laughs> like if someone's worth 20 points, you might say, all right, I'll struggle through this. Five points, don't waste too much time if you get stuck. All right, well, to use the um, direct census approach, we have an equation that if we have that particular GD I gave you, there's an equation in the notes that says GC equals 1 over G, 1 over tau CS. That's the design equation. You just have to plug into it. Okay, there's the 1 over G, and there's the 1 over tau S. Okay, I immediately say this is not a PID controller. Why? Because the denominator, for it to be a PID controller, it can't have a term like this, right? It can't have a term like that in the denominator. Whoops. What happened? Wow. This thing advances. I know it advanced um, in um, Adobe Acrobat. Okay. So everyone remembers what a... So if you want to determine if something is a PID controller, I tell you, you should always write it this way. Um, be tau I S here. And then I'm going to get, I'm not very smart today, um, tau D It's written in a stupid way, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> anyway, um, how do I know it looks like this? Because if you were to rewrite this, this first term, right, the tau i cancels and you get a tau d s. That's the derivative part of the controller. And then you get a 1 over tau i s. That's the integral part of the controller. And then you get a plus 1. That's the, that's the, that's the proportional part of the controller. So if you want to um, know if something's PID, you want to put the standard PID f in this form. And then you just want to look and say, are the orders of the polynomial of my controller the same as these? And if it is, it is a PID controller. You don't have to find tau d, tau i, and all that. Okay. But it doesn't take a rocket scientist to come over here and say, wow, that denominator does not look like that. Right? It's not a constant times s. So that's not PID. You're done with that, okay? Okay, then I ask you, to do, does the controller have integral action? Here's how you test if a controller has integral action. Take your controller transfer function, plug in 0 for s, and it should be equal to infinity. In other words, there should be a factorable 1 over s term in the controller. And there it is, and you plug it in, that's what you get, so it has integral action. It's that easy, okay? All right, then I tell you, um, f um, check and see for what values of tau c this is stable. Now, you should remember that we explicitly designed the controller so it's stable for all tau c greater than zero. That's the whole design procedure. But um, if you wanted to show that, I mean, it would be fine here if you said, look, the controller's designed such that it's stable for all tau c greater than zero. I would just even accept that. Okay? But I went ahead and derived it here. I formed the characteristic equation, right? 1 plus g times gc. Um, and everything cancels, because that's how the controller is designed. That cancels, that cancels, that cancels, that cancels. You end up with this. You end up with tau c s plus 1 as being the characteristic equation. That's by design. It's not by chance. Okay? So it's stable for all tau c greater than 0, right? So you're done. So again, if you see something that looks like it's got a bunch of parts and complex, but it's only worth 5 points, it's not, it should be easy. All right. On to the next part. Okay, so now I have another controller. This is flash drum. Okay, so this is from the flash drum outlet flow rate and flash drum pressure. So just for your edification, that is um, this controller right here I'm talking about. Okay, this controls the pressure of the flash drum and it manipulates the vapor flow out of the, out of the drum. Okay, but you don't, need to, you don't need to have drawn this picture. You can just proceed. Okay, and again, I'm not going to ask you to draw this picture, at least not a picture this complex. Okay, so what was the question? So I give you this transfer function. Looks a little unwieldy, to say the least, but it's not too bad. All right, so I'm giving you a transfer function. The input in this case is the uh, vapor flow rate out of that drum, and the output is the pressure of the, of the, in the drum itself, okay? Okay. So now I say two things. First of all, design IMC controller for this. Okay? 
in the IMC controller is to have a closed loop transfer function, also known in the IMC method as GF. It's called F of S instead of GD of S, same thing. <laughs> one over t S plus one, that means the tau C is one for this case. Okay. Um, so that's part one. And you notice I say just design the IMC controller. You remember the second step after you design the IMC controller is to get the regular feedback controller, GC, but that's just a ton of algebra. It doesn't, doesn't, it would be a lot of work for this case. I'm not even asking for that, okay? So be sure to read the questions. Um, you could certainly do it. I wouldn't give you any points for it, but I'd be proud of you, all right? Um, then the next thing I'm asking you is determine the closed loop response um, when you subject this to a set point change, okay? Um, and then draw in a qualitative way the response. So again, if you look at this five points, this tells you this is not hard as it might appear at first. Right, normally this is a real pain, right? F find the closed loop transfer function and then multiply that times one over S and then try to take the inverse Laplace transform. Maybe you gotta do partial fraction expansion, probably not, okay, if it's only worth five points. All right, so let's see how you do this one. What am I doing? Seems like I'm totally in the wrong spot. Oh, no. Yes. Okay. All right. So, hopefully you can read the hieroglyphics here, but this is S squared plus five. That's what, looks like there's an S missing there. There should be an S right there. Okay. Five S minus six, and then this denominator is S cubed plus five S squared plus eight S plus four. Okay, so if I see something like this, the first thing I'm thinking is, I wonder if I can factor that thing, right? Because it's going to be easier to work with if it's factored than this, okay? I might even tr trick you in a sense, I might have two terms that cancel if you factor it. So everyone, like, how did I factor this one? I'm not going to lie to you, I went into MATLAB. How did I come up with this in the first place? I took this and multiplied it out, so I got this and gave it to you in this form, but... Everyone has a calculator that can find roots, right? I mean, come on. No. no. You don't? I do everything by it. Who are you people? <laughs> All right. Well, how about this? How about this then? How about I just start with it in this form for you guys, okay? Because you're the first class I've ever had that can't afford calculators <laughs> that find roots. My son has one of those. In fact, he has two of them. You might remember the whole, you need to get me a new calculator thing. All right. Okay then. So here's the factored form that you guys will get directly, all right? So then I'm asking you to, de to design an IMC controller. So the first thing that you want to do, so here's just the closed loop. I already gave you this. F of S is 1 over tau C S plus 1. And for this problem, tau C is 1. That's right, just 1 over S plus 1. So we know the first thing. First thing is we have to factor this thing, right? If you do the IMC method. And the whole reason I'm giving you IMC is because you need to factor. So if we look at this, we say, okay, um, we need to factor G into a G plus and a G minus, and the first thing we have to do is get the G plus, okay? The first step in getting the G plus is seeing if there's anything naughty in the numerator or time, there's no time delay, so just in the numerator, and I, can't, I can see here, you can see there's an S minus two, right? That's bad because that's a, that's a right half plane zero. Right, that's a zero right here at s equal plus two. And that's the kind of thing we have to get rid of, right? When we do this design procedure. All right, so that's step one. Put the, put the bad zero into the G plus. The next step is make the G plus an all pass, okay? An all pass means if you have a zero here, you need a pole at the mirror reflection of this, also known as s equal minus two, okay? That means just put S plus two here. Bottom line is if you have like 37 S plus, I mean minus 92, you'd put 37 S plus 92 in the denominator. It's not, it's not so hard, okay? Final step, is this thing have a gain of zero, right? You can check the gain of any transfer function by setting S equals zero, and as written, the gain is minus one. So that's, you need a minus sign right there, okay? Now you've got the G plus. The G minus, obviously, is going to be the same transfer function I gave you, which I have to look here. <coughs> I 
except the s minus t the s minus two is going to be replaced by a minus s plus two. Okay. And now you can see my genius. Dare I say such a thing? Oh, sorry, you're not even. I guess it doesn't matter because I'm writing the same thing on the board. Genius might be a tad bit overstated here, but um, so what's the denominator again? S plus two squared. Okay, you, you follow me? First thing, factor. And then once you have this, you know G, obviously, you can get the, the G minus, but it's just going to consist of having a minus S plus 2 here instead of the S minus 2 that was originally there. All right, and I made life a little bit easy. Saying it's genius is, is uh, obviously uh, ridiculous. Um, you cancel that. You can cancel that. Um, and then you get... All right, minus s plus 3, and then this guy is what? s plus 2 times s plus 1. Okay? All right, so that's that. It's all written up here, so I'm going to stop writing. So unless I made a mistake, I got this right here. You can probably read what's on the board, but not here. Okay, then to form the IMC controller, you might recall it's 1 over the g minus times the f. There's the g minus, there's the f, and dare I say, genius strikes once more. As we can cancel the s plus 1's and we come up with this simple thing, minus s plus 2 over s plus 3. All right. <laughs> I never underestimate my abilities, but I often overestimate them. All right. So there, there you have it. That's that part. Okay, so the next part says, um, please compute the closed loop response of this controller. Now here's one where if you go the wrong direction, you'll waste a lot of time. In the notes, there's this equation written, okay? You might recall that when we did the direct synthesis procedure, this is IMC, but when we did direct synthesis, our goal was to get a desired transfer function GD between the set point and the output. And that's how the controller's designed. But when we did the IMC method, we admitted we couldn't actually do this because of stuff like in the numerator, like this kind of zero, and therefore, we had to settle, and this equation is in the book and the notes. Whoops, that's F. F here plays the exact same role as GD. These are the same thing. They're just two methods use different notation. So you can't just get F here, which you want. You, just, you have to leave behind. You cannot cancel this G plus thing. Okay? So the key to solving this problem is, is realizing this is true. You can derive this by plugging, you know, you could find y over ys and plug everything in. Eventually you'd get here, but you'd waste lots of time getting there. Okay? So once you realize that, um, your g plus times f, I'm asking you, what is the response of this for a set point change? Okay? So there's the g plus. It's written on the board as well. There's the f. There's the set point, right, because we're trying to compute the response. Um, multiply all this out, you get this. Now, we all know the game here, right? You take a look at this thing you have, and you say, boy, i got to take the inverse Laplace transform to get from y of s to y of t. I sure hope that's in the table. What is it, 3.1? Something like that. I forget the actual table number. So I'm going to try to rearrange this to look like something in the table, right? And you can see... Well, I've already done it through some manipulations, but you can see right here, right, that what are you going to get? You're going to get the numerator is a first order thing in S, the denominator is a second order thing in S times S, right? So 